Thanks for the opportunity to speak to you today. Look, this is very much an area that hit the prime time a, a little while ago, and MR is considered the gold standard for assessing RV structure and function. And I'm going to take you through the basics of that, because many of you may not be familiar with the planes that we use to assess the right ventricle and, and the intricacies uh, and some of the key messages in doing that accurately. There are several indications for functional and anatomical analysis of the RV for which we use MRI. There's uh, uh, now an indication in Australia for um, uh, evaluating ARVC, but I'm careful to put the R in brackets because it's really a, a syndrome that affects both ventricles. Any time that there's a suspicion of a right ventricular cardiomyopathy, uh, perhaps when there's discordant information or incomplete information from echocardiography, and that especially goes for when there's coexistence valvular heart disease. And finally, the complex congenital uh, cases, it's absolutely essential because of the, the cross-sexual anatomy and function that we can simultaneously evaluate. Um, and I'm sure Raj will come and, uh, cover some of that a bit later. Some of the challenges in, in functional imaging have already been mentioned and, and, and described to you. Uh, with regard to 3D uh, echocardiography, it really has allowed for better bedside assessment of the right ventricle, but when there is free wall dropout, which can be overcome with the, with the administration of echo contrast, um, uh, th there are some limits to assessing the right ventricle in totality. And the commercially available semi-quantitative software uh, isn't routinely used in all laboratories. With regards to MR, its whole strength, as alluded to by Sean earlier, was the fact that uh, you can uh, assess the base of the heart and its complex anatomy with this tri you know, triangular or tubular structure around the anterior uh, aspect uh, uh, very accurately. And uh, one of my key points today is though that this re really requires a skilled and careful analysis. For any of you who have have looked at a cardiac MR, you'll be familiar with these images, but our very first image is what we call a scout image, and that is basically to place the human being or the heart inside the magnet and know your landmarks to plan all your subsequent imaging. So we're not dependent on acoustic windows. Uh, we can overcome body habitus in, in many regards in order to, to assess the heart in three dimensions. And from that, we'll, uh, we'll uh, generate a series of slices in st still images, either so-called black blood or white blood images for obvious reasons. There are strengths and weaknesses of both sort of modality uh, sequences uh, in terms of speed of acquisition and, and, uh, and the, in terms of the, the definition of vascular anatomy. But for the purposes of planning our subsequent imaging, it doesn't really matter. Now this is a view you may have seen with, uh, before, but uh, uh, don't necessarily appreciate uh, 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 until you can see how it's generated. Basically, from the axial set of slices I illustrated earlier, we take a, what would be an, an oblique sagittal image that passes through the midpoint of the tricuspid valve approximately through the right ventricular apex, appreciating the fact that the RV apex, even in normal individuals, will wrap around the LV, so it's difficult to achieve a plane that passes through the true apex. So in this particular view, uh, it will be foreshortened. But you can immediately appreciate the anatomy that Sean was talking about that defines a right ventricle in terms of its inflow and its outflow. And these, uh, th this image uh, also, once we achieve a four-chamber view, will illustrate some of the essential anatomic characteristics uh, that Sean showed you on the cadaveric specimens, namely the uh, rough apical trabeculations in the right ventricle as opposed to the finer trabeculations in the left ventricle, the septal wall attachments and the moderator band in the right ventricle, and the fact that the tricuspid valve is relatively apically displaced compared to the mitral valve, and, and that becomes important in defining the right ventricle, and of course the, the lack of connection between inflow and outflow. This becomes very important when defining chambers uh, 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 in complex congenital heart disease. 
Now, the bread and butter of cardiac MR really comes down to segmentation and contouring of uh, the ventricles in order to quantify the, their size and their function. And you'll be familiar with the summation of discs methods from echocardiography, and you can appreciate that because of the excellent spatial resolution here, we can contour the left ventricle quite nicely. But I'd like to focus your eye on the right ventricle. Because in this particular case, it's not too difficult to contour the right ventricle from the, the, the true apical slice is not included here, but up to the base. And when we take a slice that's 8 or 10 millimetres thick from a, con a conventional sequence, uh, there'll be a point at which one of the slices towards the base of the heart will pass very close, if not through, the tricuspid valve. And so there may be so-called partial voluming where part of the slice includes the left, uh, right atrium and part of it includes the right ventricle. And one has to be very careful in order to accurately delineate these contours to be confident that you're including uh, uh, the ventricular structure only and not only the right atrium. So in this particular case, I think it's relatively straightforward. But where it becomes quite challenging and where it really requires practice and having a set of sort of inter internal checks is when there is right ventricular pathology, when the right ventricle is dilated particularly. And certainly uh, when the fellows are stuck in a dark room as they are in, in the, for cardiac MRI contouring these manually, this is really probably the biggest learning curve. In this particular case, in the four-chamber view, you can see that the free wall basal segment of the RV is included within this slice uh, illustrated by the red line. And so this short axis image is taken in, uh, in this plane and you can see that that therefore is part of the right vent ventricle rather than, for example, the right atrial appendage. Uh, similarly, these other views, which I'll go through later, this is a right ventricular outflow tract view, the short axis slice passes through this yellow line, which is a sub-pulmonary uh, plane. It's below the pulmonary valve. So this is part of the right ventricular outflow tract, which we include as part of the right ventricle uh, in terms of contouring and, and calculating its volumes. So uh, whenever contouring the right ventricle, it's, being, it's essential to be careful uh, that you contour only the ventricle and not the atrium. And I would make a point here that automated tools are very artificial and not always so intelligent when it comes to semi-automated quantification, and particularly when it comes to the right ventricle. The latest software packages still need a lot of massaging and, and manual work uh, for you to accurately do this. Now, why is this important? Well, it's critical in uh, cases of surgical planning and timing of intervention for uh, patients, for example, with repaired tetralogy of fallow and your serially monitoring the right ventricular size and its function. And so there are guidelines for this. Uh, the convention is that we would include contours, as I've said, up to but not superior to the pulmonary valve, and that the trabeculae and pap muscles are included in the RV volumes for improved reproducibility, uh, and that uh, any uh, intra if, assuming that there are no intra or extra cardiac shunts, the right ventricle and left ventricular stroke volumes as calculated uh, from your contours should be roughly equal, but they won't be exactly equal because there are differences in the bronchial arterial supply and therefore the stroke volumes between the two chambers. There are other ways uh, uh, to assess right ventricular volumes, and some laboratories around the world will use this method, and that is to use uh, cine images in your axial stack. Uh, and the reason for that is you can more accurately define the tricuspid uh, annular plane as opposed to the short axis images where it can be difficult to see. And this has been demonstrated to show uh, a higher inter-observer uh, reproducibility. Uh, I would routinely uh, perform an RV or axial cine stack in any study of the right vent ventricle as an internal control, so if there are discordant volumes you can double check, but also in order to be able to uh, assess the free wall for any abnormalities in structure or function, so it's absolutely essential there. So a rare but illustrative case uh, w w which sort of sums up a number of the messages I've just uh, uh, put forward is this case where you can see, uh, unfortunately the loop's not playing, but you'll see that the tricuspid uh, septal 
leaflet is significantly apically displaced, up to 37 millimetres, and therefore the, the functional right atrium is very large and the right ventricle is sm relatively smaller and you have an area of atrialised right ventricle. And that, of course, is Epstein's anomaly. And so one obviously would need to be very careful when contouring uh, the right ventricle in order to accurately see where the plane of the tricuspid valve is. And we can also look at its, uh, uh, its various septal attachments accurately in that particular case. The next step is really assessing the right ventricular outflow tract. And that is done by reverting back to our imaging planning stage from our black or white blood images. And you'll appreciate the main pulmonary artery here uh, uh, diverging into its branches. And again, uh, an oblique sagittal image that, uh, uh, that passes through that main pulmonary artery generates this RVOT cine. You can appreciate the uh, anterior wall of the right ventricle, the pulmonary valve, its distensibility, the RVOT's distensibility uh, and the distensibility in the dilatation of the main pulmonary artery if there is any. And you can also see in this same plane we will capture more posteriorly the left atrium and the mitral valve and, and part of the left ventricle and the, the aortic valve. We then take an orthogonal view to that uh, which is a, a, a second uh, RVOT view. And this becomes really important when we perform flow imaging. And I think uh, another key message I would make today that when you're assessing right ventricular pathology and you're certainly uh, in a situation where the right ventricle is enlarged, and this is why it's important to supervise these scans and, and assess them live if you can, it's essential to look at pulmonary blood flow. And so we take a perpendicular slice to the, the, the uh, outflow tract in the main pulmonary artery and we generate a so-called velocity encoded imaging image which is basically looking at the uh, speed of protons as they pass through a plane uh, and we can contour that on a magnitude image. You'll see this patient has had previous surgery, they're um, in a repaired tetralogy case and you have to be careful that the artefact from sternal wires can potentially um, play havoc with uh, your data. So we'll generate a flow curve like this and integrate under the curve to generate a forward volume and potentially a, a backward volume if there's any significant regurgitant flow. And it's a nice internal check to see that that forward volume equals roughly our stroke volume generated from our contours. So this is a, a really important step because if there's a large discordance between those two values, one has to ask the question why that is. Is there some sort of shunt somewhere that accounts for that? Is there an error in the way that you've uh, acquired the data? Do you need to go back and accurately uh, uh, review your imaging planes because they're non-orthogonal? Or is there a gating or misregistration issue if the patient has frequent ectopy or is in atrial fibrillation? It may be very difficult to acquire accurate flows using 2D flows uh, uh, in, in this sequence. But then again, if the numbers don't make sense, and this is a real trap, um, it, it may indicate a real shunt. Uh, uh, and so one has to be very honest about uh, interrogating this data. So in order to focus a bit more on the right ventricle, and I know some cases will be presented uh, later on today, but you can visually see that the right ventricle is enlarged in relation to the left ventricle, and that's one way to express it. Uh, you can visually see that the um, right ventricle outflow tract is hyperkinetic, it's, it's dilated, and even visually you can appreciate there's pulmonary regurgitation, although I'd caution to uh, quantify that visually on an MRI because we're looking at dephasing here rather than absolute flow. Um, and then we can quantify that flow as I've just illustrated and you can see a forward and reverse curve here to look at the degree of pulmonary regurgitation. And putting all of this information together uh, through this illustrative case is really helpful. We can calculate the absolute forward flow um, uh, which is 130 mils here through the pulmonary valve, yet the net flow is 60 mils, which is fairly close to the net forward flow through the aortic valve. Importantly, the forward flow also equals the right stroke volume, which makes sense. It's in systole, it's our forward flow. So we've quantified several key parameters from the right ventricle here. We've quantified the size that's indexed, uh, 
uh, and the stroke volume, we've quantified the forward flow from the pulmonary valve, which would equal the stroke volume, and the net flow, which should be close to your aortic flow, and also quantified the degree of uh, pulmonary regurgitation. So there's a lot of data here, and it should be internally consistent. Ad additionally, through the administration of gadolinium-based contrast, uh, uh, we can assess for scar afterwards and it's not uh, uh, surprising that in a repair to trilogy case there will be delayed enhancement following a patch um, uh, repair and there may well be some delayed enhancement in the uh, inferior septal junction which is common in these sorts of patients or patients indeed with uh, uh, any state of pulmonary hypertension as well. And I, in terms of talking about flows, I think it, it's important to recognise that, that when there are discordant flows, it should really trigger a search for the cause. So in this particular case, uh, it, there's a marked discordance between the calculated aortic and pulmonary flow with a calculated QP to QS of 1.92. Uh, and in this patient who had a dilated right ventricle as assessed uh, by echo prior. And after the administration of gadolinium-based contrast, not all laboratories would routinely acquire a magnetic resonance angiogram, uh, but we certainly do, and that's very, it's very useful in order to uh, define the vascular anatomy, because this patient, as it turns out, has partial anomalous pulmonary venous drainage to, to the superior vena cava. You can uh, appreciate here on a multiplane reconstruction uh, and, and then in three dimensions. So we've acquired all of this information uh, and answered the question and that's the power of, uh, of such a modality. Um, were you to not acquire the MRA uh, with the administration of contrast and you still had the question of why there are discordant flows, you could go back to those initial subsets of uh, axial images uh, that I showed at the beginning and go searching, but you won't always clearly be able to define the anatomy and then you'd um, potentially go on to do a CT uh, uh, or invasive testing. So my key takeaway messages here really are uh, in relation to the anatomy that Sean's illustrated that the RV is a complex crescent shaped chain chamber that really MRI comes to the fore in terms of uh, uh, three dimensional functional imaging. Accurate contouring uh, is absolutely key for volumes and it's useful to have internal checks and balances by using the flows, which I believe are essential to RV imaging, uh, uh, certainly because you can pick up uh, uh, anomalies that will lead you to define the cause for RV pathology.